All right, everybody, welcome to geology. Let's talk sediments. So we did the weathering stuff last time. That's That would be where bedrock breaks down into sediments. Now let's open the door on sediment a little bit more. And to start, I went back actually and grabbed some of the sedimentary rock notes that you've already done in a previous uh, segment of this course because they, they kind of live together. You know what I'm saying? This is sedimentary rock made from layer upon layer upon layer of sediments that was compacted as we learned all back then, right? Now, if we're weathering it and bringing it down, we're seeing it turn back into sediments again. And the rock's like, oh, why not bring that back up again? Because it's all, it, it's tough to separate these two, right? Outcropping of any rock will produce sediments. So then, yes, if that gets buried and compacted, you create sedimentary rock. But we didn't really, when we did this, focus in on how sediment might move around the surface of the earth. And then, so we'll do a bit on that today. We also have... I believe we have, yeah, we have streams in another uh, chapter that's part of this course section. So, excuse me, that'll be coming. The sedimentary environments, good to throw back out there again. Where does sediment potentially land? Consider in your life where you've been somewhere, and I know you probably didn't say like, oh, look at this sediment. But have you been to a beach? Have you been to like a river with a muddy bottom? Have you seen sand dunes? Have you seen places where sediment can accumulate? keep that in mind as we do it. And today we'll talk a little bit more about not necessarily the cementation or lithification into rock, but the nature of the rounding and sorting of the rock, which was something we brought up back here. What was unsorted versus well sorted? Remember this big terrifying chart? I got some simpler ones here, right? So I know this is all, this is all an eyeful, but we said back when we did this, the, the meat and potatoes of this are the official sediment sizes. Boulders, cobbles, pebbles, sand, silt, clay. Well, here that is again. This is the simple one out of your textbook, Boulder, Cobble, Pebble, Sand, Silk, Clay. This one's out of the um, good old New York State reference tables. And this one proves a point that I'd like to talk about. Proves, doesn't prove, but it, it, it illustrates a point that I'd like to talk about, which is how fast does water have to be going to move different sized particles, which they talk about right about here. So check this section of the chapter out, page 13, if you're on the PDF. Um, how fast does water have to be going? So, I mean, consider using a hose to try to, you know, wash your car, right? If it's if it's really stuck on there, if it's really big things, you put your thumb over it and you make it go faster to, to, to more efficiently erode the sediment off your car and maybe move bigger particles. If you've done that, you've done this math in your head, only it doesn't look as intimidating in your head, right? Um, Here's our particle sizes again, boulders, cobbles, pebbles, sand, silt, clay. This line then would represent what speed does the water have to go to move these different sized particles. And then this one gets into defining them by size as well, which this one did too. This one, again, is just a little bit more intimidating looking. And that's maybe the simplest looking. So have these ready and maybe think about like if <coughs> I were to do one of these questions, which I'm not sure. Um, but it's say a stream velocity if, if I did, you need this chart, obviously. If the stream is going one centimeter per second, how big is the particle that it can carry? It's a sand-sized particle that's about that size in centimeters. All right, 0.02. All right, that's that's the that's like if if I do one of these nitty nitty gritty questions, I don't really know. Broadly, which which is something that should just kind of get into our noggin. The faster the water goes, the larger the particle it can move. So this part of the chapter talks about like a stream that flows high in the spring and goes fast enough that it's banging these boulders around, but down to just a trickle in the other seasons. Uh, which gets us into some ideas of sorting. Like in general, sorting, and maybe I have a video I shot on a beach. Maybe I'll, I'll try to find that and throw it up here. If you're at a beach, even at a, at a, if you go down to the beach on campus on a chaotic day where the waves are blowing all over the place, that is sorting sediment and it's doing it remarkably well. All you got to do to test that is look down. All of the cobbles where you stand are going to be roughly the same size. And on campus, when I was on campus, I used to do a lab where we'd work our way from the far end by the tennis courts down by Rudy's and Bev's um, right up towards the health center around that curve. And the sizes change like very steadily from one side to the other. And we looked at how the energy changes as it goes through campus and all of that. 
But consider that, that in these systems that might feel chaotic, if there's running water, if there's wind, they're actually very good at sorting out particles. Because things that are light, just like this chart right here, oops, things that are light get carried by things by either wind or water that has lower energy. Things that are heavy can't be carried by things that are lower energy. So like whatever it is, it can pick up everything smaller, but it can't move anything bigger. So the smaller things all get carried somewhere else. And therefore, like along Lake Ontario from campus and where I live over in Sterling and all of that, you've got all the cobble beaches up towards there being sand beaches out the window here in uh, the east end of Lake Ontario where there's sand dunes, sandy beaches, things like that. So sorting and rounding kind of live together. The more well sorted. But also, I mean, you think about how it, if it's traveling in the stream and I don't have the last set of notes open, but we had that thing open where we looked at how sediment like either is in suspension or is part of the bed load that's bouncing around. Well, the longer it travels in the stream, generally the more abrasion that takes place, the rounder they're going to get. So therefore, really what you can do is that's why sedimentary rocks, that's maybe one of the arguments for them being a cooler one, because if you go and analyze the sediment, you can figure out its history. Is it well sorted? Is it well rounded? What markers do I look for to find out exactly what environment this was and what was else, what was going on elsewhere to produce this sediment, to drop it down into whatever this specific depositional environment was. And you start to get a picture for what the earth looked like, like the pages of a book a long time ago. All right. Anything else we want to hit up, up here, grain size, composition. I think we're good. And then we'll talk about soils a little bit and uh, call it a quick one. All right, soils. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's a weird way to define it, but it's what I've done in the best. A thin layer between the, let's just get a color going here. Atmosphere, bedrock, right? What's going on there? And it really, this is gonna be the thing. We'll, we'll put a star next to this or something that develops due to the weathering of the underlying bedrock. We know from the last thing you did Weathering is the breakdown and biological activity from life processes on top. So those two, there's no way there's not going to be a question on that. Work together to form what a soil is. Take the underlying bedrock and break it down That from the bottom. Take whatever organically is going on on top and what does that do to the soil? What does it add to the soil through seasons, through whatever going, is going on in that climate? Let me pause here. Sorry about that. Uh, what's going on like life process wise to create that soil, right? So think of, consider two very different examples. There's the Adirondacks where we've got an extremely hard bedrock. What does that mean in terms of weathering? It does not weather easily. But it's in upstate New York where there's lots of humidity We've got the seasons going back and forth, so you end up with a high organic content. For anybody that's done some hiking up there and uh, stepped in some of that mud, it's like a rich black organic soil. So much and so that in some of the sections of the high peaks, they don't let you have fires because it, it's so organic, the soil, that it can like burn within the soil. Uh, so this. Take that and just compare it to a random desert, a desert I've never been to, right? So there's plenty of bedrock available. It's very low life. So if you just consider those in terms of like soil formation, one is since they form from the breakdown of that rock and whatever's going on organically on top, that's why the soils in the desert versus the Adirondacks would look very different, right? It's kind of like picking two dramatic endpoints to illustrate a point. Now, does it get more complicated than that? Sure. Look at that. Uh, ter uh, what, ternary diagram, right? And different ways that they can form in different climates. I won't bust your chops about specifics here. We'll keep it broad, um, but keep that in mind. And certainly those two, there's no, again, there's no way that I won't do a question about that. Um, so, and I threw some mass wasting stuff in here, but I think I'm going to hold off on that. So I don't keep you here too long today. Um, and another thing, and this is, is especially true in New York, some of what we see develop in place and some are transported. Now we haven't really brought glaciers into the party so far in this course, but glaciers 
in this area of upstate New York were potentially like a mile thick. They could carry an enormous amount of soil materials and uh, drop them off. So what you might see then is uh, soil formation taking place, which again, bedrock breaks down and, and life or develops organic material. But some of it is that glaciers brought that in too. So around here, it's like a glacial plain. We've got all kinds of that glacial. We've got bedrock, a lot of glacial till, and then on top of that, some soil. For example, you can see that here. If you've been to the bluffs of the Sterling Nature Center or Chimney Bluff State Park or Fairhaven uh, Beach State Park, um, they're all drumlins. It's a glacial feature we'll learn eventually. And Lake Ontario has been kind enough to go cut these drumlins in half so that we geologists can go there and geek out and look at them, right? So a couple things to note in this picture. One, this is all glacial till. And how do I know that is an interesting point. It's a, it, and it brings in this sorted versus unsorted idea that I brought up towards the beginning of this video. And your book maybe has in there, maybe it doesn't. I thought it did. But, uh, sorry, everybody. Okay, sorted versus unsorted. The glaciers being that big and powerful carry these enormous amounts of material and drop them all at once. So this is, if you go to the Sterling Nature Center and go to these bluffs, which I recommend, they're great, you're going to get all the particle sizes all in one big pile. Boulders, cobbles, pebbles, sand, silk, clay. They're all visible in this shot right here from the beach, right? Look at the size of that boulder embedded in things as tiny as clay. It's all of them, completely unsorted, and that's a signature of a glacial deposit. The glaciers push everything, drop it, and yes, a couple more intricate things happen, but long story short, that's it. They drop all that material and don't bother to sort it out at all because the agents that sort things are like your wind and running water. So you get down to the beach at the bottom and it's like a cobble beach. This is from an old field trip. It's like a cobble beach. Those are all sorted. And the sands and silts, you can see the water looks kind of turbid there, a little bit muddy. Sands and silts are being carried away. Cobbles and pebbles are being left behind. And certainly along the beach, if you go a little bit, you can find big boulders sitting around. They're not going anywhere either, right? So that idea of sorting kind of hides in there. Now, what we have, I don't know if I can zoom in on this. What we have right towards the top here would be then the formation of a soil that's happened post glaciers. You've got a thin layer right here with grass on top and you can see how it's like a rich organic thing. I've got another slide, let me grab it, quick pause. So this one's from a, a, a guy that went out onto one of the like little spires, which is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Don't ever do this, but I'm going to use this picture anyway, because it shows us that top layer there of um, soils developing where you can clearly see the different stuff here. So the transported dumped glacial till with the development of an organic soil on top because of the breakdown of that underlying material with the organic material on top especially in upstate New York, seasonally living, dying, living, dying, living, dying, and so on. What do you think? So again, I think we'll save um, mass wasting for another video, and there's a whole chapter on it, so we'll, we'll get more into that then. Uh, the horizons, I mean, take, take a peek at this. Maybe I'll come up with one question that's pretty close to literally what's on here just to like throw it out there, but you know, for non-majors, I think memorizing all of this, if you're a major, you might want to get your Get your hands dirty with this a little bit. Um, but this is like a naming system for what layers you might find. And then these can all be different in different climates and different bedrock sources and things like that. So it's not, a, it's a, uh, it's a deeper story than this. Finally, like consider soil as a resource. It, it's a very slow developing thing. And it's, it's one of those like resource management things that just, I don't know, it's not too, not too exciting, right? To, to say, to talk about soil conservation. It's not like a super, you know, exciting thing to talk about soil conservation when there's other, like, you could think about water and, and rainforest and all of that, you know, habitat. Those, those are maybe a little bit more exciting, but consider it. Um, what farming practices, and, and if you've ever uh, read about the um, Dust Bowl, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what happened throughout the United States in that era. Uh, maybe we'll do it a little bit more, depending on how we go at the end of the year when it comes to talking about resources. 
Um, but you can see it around here. You can see where there are fields that are farming fields that are that are cut right down to like the little corn stalks every year. Then consider all of the rain and snow melt that's going to happen on that. That's going to transport that soil away to then come and do it next year. It's a it's being washed into streams and rivers faster than it is developing in these fields. And I'm not like, you know, I've got friends that 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 I'd say hard job to, to be a farmer. And I know it's 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 tight and it's not like uh, I don't want to stand here on my high ground as the is the guy saying, don't do that. You don't have to listen to the geeks. You know, they're going to say <laughs> I'm trying to make a living here. Right. But broadly, how could we like have processes and practices that are better at conserving that soil, considering the length of time that it takes to develop and how easy it is to wash away? I will not quiz you on Canadian soils. Deal? All right, let's call that video good. We will see you soon. Keep up with chapter eight here, and then we'll get into the next two very soon. Thanks, everybody.